That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Monsters, the Lyle and Eric Menendez story, which is, of course, the second season of Ryan Murphy's Monsters uh, anthology series, which uh, nine episodes all dropped at the same time on September 19th, 2024 on Netflix. We watched season one, which was about Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm -hmm. And then I know I've watched the American crime story of O.J. Simpson, which was also Ryan Murphy. And then we watched the Gianni Versace assassination of Gianni Versace, which I enjoyed all of those. Mm -hmm. What is this season about? This riveting true crime drama probes the lives of the Menendez brothers convicted of the brutal 1989 murders of their parents in Beverly Hills. What's your pull quote? The success of Ryan Murphy's productions depend upon the power of performers who can dig beneath the sensationalism of the tabloid fodder he resurrects. But there's no real saving grace to this endlessly protracted sleaze of of a perverted American dream. Yep, mine. Clunky dialogue, narrative redundancy, and hammy performances plunge this series into campy schlock. It is. It feels like all of Ryan Murphy's worst tendencies but there are some shining moments sure but so in addition to the series we mentioned i know i watched like ratchet Mm -hmm. feud the one about betty and joan you haven't seen capote and so of the six series i've watched because i haven't watched any of the american horror story this menendez brothers one was the worst yeah the the story is pretty simple so lyle and eric menendez are brothers and their parents jose and kitty uh make up this family of four they live in beverly hills in this beautiful mansion the dad at the time was an executive for rca records we understand that he's worth a lot of money it's anywhere from like 30 to 75 million i think we're told Mm -hmm. Uh, plus a five million dollar life insurance policy which we'll get to but uh one night in not in 1989 August 20th. He, his, uh, the two children kill the parents. They blast them away with shotguns. Uh. And there were two trials because the first trial was a, determined to be a mistrial and then the second. So we go through mm-hmm. the first trial where the focus is really on the defense saying that the two boys were horribly abused sexually by their father. And they use the uh, explanation that it is imperfect self-defense, which... It's not fully explained, but it would seem that it means that they thought their life, their lives were in imminent danger. And so they preemptively killed their parents. And that seemed to work because... It was a way to get around the premeditation of it. And it seemed to work because the women of the jury seemed to agree. But it was a hung jury. Because mm-hmm. then we're told the men was, weren't really buying it and didn't like their attorney, Leslie Abramson. Well, Eric's attorney. Eric's attorney. The second trial, because during the first trial, Lyle's dumbass kept writing letters and he had made this like pen pal girlfriend who he was telling everything to, like how he's pretending to cry to try to convince the jury, blah, blah, blah. She recorded his ass and made a book about it before the second trial. So during the second trial, Lyle couldn't testify because he was like the star witness in the first trial. Like he really brought the uh, waterworks. So this go around, he can't testify because now the prosecution can question him about those recordings. So now we just have to rely on Eric. And Eric is meant to be the more meek, weak, feeble one. Mm -hmm. And he does not disappoint on uh, on, on the stand. And so they are convicted of premeditated murder and are each sentenced to two life sentences without parole. The end. Yes, there you go. Okay, what are your overall thoughts? Uh, I liked Javier Bardem and Ari Greiner did grow on me as Leslie Abramson. But and and Chloe Sevigny is fun, but this felt like it was It wanted to be a black comedy, but tonally is all over the place. So there was there was not a lot to like, but every now and then there's a scene or a moment that almost makes it worth your time. I agree. There's more I didn't like than what I actually liked. I think Javier Bardem gives the best performance. Mm -hmm. But overall, this feels like a poorly written dark comedy. There's a what episode is it about the dimes? 
when Lyle is trying to make phone calls and he needs That's episode three. He needs dimes. It felt like it was so desperately trying to turn into some kind of Ursatz version of Chicago, like a musical. The oh my gosh. So the portrayal of Lyle and Eric, so the dad, Jose is played by Javier Bardem. Mm-hmm. The mom Kitty's played by Chloe Sevigny. Mm-hmm. Eric is played by Cooper Coke. Who I know from the movie Swallowed. Mm-hmm. And Lyle is played by... Nicholas Alexander Chavez. Okay, there's so much I'm confused by. I know it's titled Monsters, but I don't quite understand what I'm supposed... Like, like what was the effect supposed to be of this series? Because straight out the gate, if a person knows nothing about the Menendez brothers, 100% cold, and you start this series, you are immediately clued into the fact that these two are monsters. They're like awful human beings. And then we see them kill their parents in episode one. Which is a pretty well, it's well staged. And if the intention is to be shocking, yeah. Yeah, the the actual murder scene is quite graphic. And it reminded me of that HBO series with Tony Collette, uh, The Staircase. Mm-hmm. During that series where they're showing the alternative theories, like with the owl or whatever. Mm-hmm. It was that graphic. But I'm not quite sure it... I guess we'll save it to the end of what I thought a better approach would have been, but it's just straight out the gate. These two kids are awful, but then also the parents are awful. Yes, but I I think that in the effort to try for ambiguity, we're seeing the the Menendez parents through the 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 fantastical spin that their children have placed upon them, and so we're getting these performances and the, in these snippets that really seem strange and kind of dumb because they they really seem unbelievable. So it's it's really jostling to, because the the series itself, I think it's the fault of the series itself is not outlining whose perspective we're at at any given moment. Yeah, I agree. And then we really don't get the alternate perspective until episode nine. Mm-hmm. So we spend eight episodes basically understanding that These were horrible parents who were abusive. There are claims against the dad and the mom. Mm -hmm. But then also the kids are, I mean, they just seem like bratty sociopaths. So then it just seems like, like the Adams family, like, (laughs) so, okay. Then a care, like I haven't hated a character this much in a long time. And this is, my commentary is based on the series. I don't want a whole bunch of comments about what happened in reality. I'm talking about what the nine episodes I saw. Nathan Lane plays Dominic Dunn, Mm -hmm. who was a journalist. Journalist, author. Mm -hmm. And he would write about these uh, sensationalized uh, crime cases. Uh And Nathan Lane, every scene, I just hated this portrayal. It it was giving like Hedda Harper. Hedda Harper. And and Luella O. Parsons. Like he's just holding these dinner parties where he's having dinner parties where he's holding court and it's all these like gay men and older women who are just hanging on every word while he pontificates about the the Menendez brothers. Mm -hmm. I found it insufferable. (laughs) It's not well staged, especially with the rapport with the nameless people that are at these functions that throw out these lines of dialogue that fall like they're weighted to the bottom of the ocean. But it's also giving me Capote, just just like Javier Bardem, as good as I think he is, if you're used to Ryan Murphy's productions, it's also the same characterization as um, Darren Criss's father in uh, the assassination of Gianni Versace and kind of this uh, this this six immigrant story success, but that is also kind of perverted by the lens of, you know, the capitalism girding the American dream. But last night I reread an essay by Elizabeth Hardwick about the Menendez brothers trial, the first right. trial, uh, who was a literary critic and novelist. And I liked, I th- and she credits Dominic Dunn for, you know, that was, that was who was, um, kind of transcribing what was going on to the country. People were listening to him, which I don't think you get in this series. No, that's that why well. I hated this portrayal so much is that we only get one mention of the influence Dominic Dunn had, which is that Leslie Abramson played by Ari Grainer. She comes home one day and complains to her husband that Dominic Dunn's words are swaying public opinion about her client. And she's upset about it. And that's it. The, 
Nathan Lane as Dominic Dunn has more screen time than Chloe Sevigny as Kitty. Mm -hmm. I just don't understand why and then not really show the public opinion swaying. We don't ever see characters talking about the Menendez brothers. And there's also a line about how there's a, a character talking about being in the closet because Eric Menendez, Menendez's uh, sexuality is uh, a, a point of contention. And Dunn was technically in the closet uh, at this time. But th this line I liked from Elizabeth Hardwick, uh, gradually the brothers offered a defense of unusual squalor, or perhaps a usual squalor, spreading its scrofulous blight over the American landscape. <laughs> okay, just to keep it structured, I'm going to go through each episode and bring up some highlights. So episode one starts with the parents' funeral. Mm -hmm. And it, we see the two brothers riding in a limousine. We later learn that RCA Records, who the dad was CEO of, is like fronting the bill for everything. And we learn later that the boys are, have some big demands, which we'll get to. But we see them riding in a limousine. Mm -hmm. You kept saying that Lyle reminded you of... Sebastian, Sebastian Stan. Stan. Sebastian Stan, particularly Stan playing Donald Trump in The Apprentice, which has not come out in the U.S. yet, but uh, th that's what he was giving me. They get to the funeral and the limo driver is very explicit. Like, I was told to drop you off in the back because there's a bunch of press at the front of the, the church or whatever. And Lyle is being vile, <laughs> saying, no, drop us off in front. Screaming all the time. They get dropped off in front and there's like a million people there, paparazzi, and they're, Lyle is soaking it up. They walk in, give their eulogies. Eric, who's uh, supposed to be, I mean, his posture, everything about him is just so meek and diminished, weak. And he gives this little, you know, heartfelt talk. And then Lyle gets up there. <clears throat> and this is when we understand that there's a fascination with the group Millie Vanilli and talk about of fakes like in fakes it's so odd we hear <laughs> another note is that i had originally because with other ryan murphy productions the music is integral like mm -hmm. really well curated soundtrack for the time so i had started a list of like oh all the artists he's going to feature and then it really only amounted to four and most of it is milli vanilli mm -hmm. but lyle is giving the most awkward eulogy about his dad and then he talks about his mom and then he cues the music and it's a milli vanilli song that ballad about i'm gonna miss you girl it's so awkward and the crowd is like this is the worst we need an episode that's called girl you know it's not true right okay then we realize that eric is having nightmares because clearly he's traumatized by what he's done and all we understand that all of his nightmares end in him killing himself and that's the only way he can wake up. But he's having visions of killing his parents. So who does he call? His therapist, played his, by... His court-appointed therapist, uh, Dallas Roberts, who's giving, giving John Ritter. <laughs> he is, but that, perf that character was written so strangely because we see Eric call Dr. Ozeal. Mm -hmm. And it would seem the way Dr. Ozeal reacts on the phone that maybe he hasn't... Like, I was 100% sure Dr. Ozeal was gay and attracted to the boys because he gets really excited mm -hmm. about talking to the boys. And then he's like fixing himself up, fixing up the office. We later learn that not only, well, I don't know that he's not gay, but he's definitely married to a lady and has a side piece, this other lady named Judalon. Judalon, yes. Who her time on the stand, which we'll get to, is probably... <laughs> It's one of a handful of highlights from this damn near eight hours we spent watching this shit. Mm -hmm. But we find out that really he's just trying to capitalize on the boy's fame and newfound fortune. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. But it's in episode one that Eric goes to Dr. Ozeal and confesses to the murders. Mm -hmm. Which of course causes a problem did you get the sense the the bit about the nightmares was given they're like in the nightmare version of the ricardos <laughs> yes actually okay it's also an episode one i'm just going through highlights of these episodes we learn that because like you already mentioned it's being told through the perspective of the kids and trying to show how awful their parents were and we see that javier bardem is just so obsessed with his sons having a very specific life mm -hmm. and controlling every aspect of it. And we see that one, one night at dinner, 
I think Lyle brings up the fact that he wants to marry his girlfriend mm -hmm. and Lyle's upset like well you two married at the same age I am now so you're such a hypocrite for telling me I can't do it mom and what does the mom do Chloe, Chloe Sevigny gets her ass up from the chair walks over to Lyle and rips off his toupee and I almost fell off the couch mm -hmm. because I didn't realize that he was not only was he bald but, and not only is he just wearing a toupee, he's wearing the kind of toupee that snaps onto your scalp. You, it's hooked in, yeah. So, because I remember those where they would uh, surgically insert the clamps that either work as magnets or like the tab on my shirt, how it pops in. <laughs> so yeah, and that's when we learned that he has that toupee. That was kind of shocking to yes. me. Yes. And then the episode ends with the murder. And we just see the boys pull up in their Ford Escort, which is a plot point that they drive a not very fancy car. They pull up into their Beverly Hills mansion driveway in this Ford Escort, well lit house, get out of the car with the shotguns, walk into the house and blast their parents. I think it was like 12 rounds. Mm -hmm. The end of episode one. So that was, it's a good start if you don't know the story. Yeah, for sure. Okay, episode two. I thought we were going to get a lot more about how the boys tried to cover up the crime. But really, we just get really awkward moments with LAPD. Those were real crunchy, all of those moments. Um, Jason Butler Harner playing Detective Les Zoller. Ugh. We get a lot of references to like the current like like episode two is filled with like, you're going to know it's 1989. We get the Reebok pump shoes. Mm -hmm. We get one of the detectives talking about how the Beverly Hills PD is disgraced because of the Zsa Zsa Gabor incident. And we get a reenactment of it, which we don't need that. No, we really don't. That we, felt like a moment out of Naked Gun. A hundred percent. With Zsa Zsa slapping the cop. Yeah. Yeah. Then we learned that the boys were taken out of the will after they were arrested for burglarizing homes like they were the original bling ring <laughs> yep yep so there's this idea about the will and that lyle wants to find the will so he can destroy it which i don't understand because if he destroys the will is he thinking that automatically they would just get the inheritance but then we do see that there's a reading of the will so i'm confused because later on in the series we see the dad called the lawyer to change his will. So why would the lawyer have the old will if there was a new will made? Right. Well, I think that they're trying to suggest that because Lyle is alone with the safe where it's the, the new, the only copy of the new will might be, that's the, how the setup is for us, and that maybe he removed it. Well, it's not clear because, again, that's something we would just never know. The we also learned in episode two that Eric, who was obsessed with a show called The Billionaire Boys Club, I believe with Judd Nelson about some rich kids killing their parents. Mm -hmm. This fool with his best friend wrote a script about killing his parents and ironically named the script Friends. Part of a script, it was 60 pages, it was like 60 pages. pages, not a feature length. Oh gosh, there's a moment because the police are trying to incriminate them. Mm -hmm. So they wire Eric's best friend and then tell him, go have dinner. And there's a scene where, like they're at dinner and there's a moment where they're talking about Eric's hot girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I thought that was laughable. But then that's also Craig, the one that he was supposedly being sexual with. Right. So then, it, but we didn't know that at that point. No, we didn't. But I, I thought, look at these two homosexuals talking about his hot girlfriend. And uh, then later we learn that that's the boy who apparently Eric had a sexual relationship with. Mm -hmm. Okay. The highlight of this episode is Judalon. So Judalon is the mistress of Dr. Ozeal. But then she, Leslie Grossman, who looks a lot like Joey Lauren Adams to me. I enjoyed her, but again, this felt like a dark comedy. Yes. Um, because she is one of Dr. Ozeal's patients. A patient mistress. Mm -hmm. And he's having an inappropriate relationship with her. And she is clearly mentally ill. And somehow convinces Dr. Ozeal to let her live with him and his wife and his kids. Because she's afraid of the Menendez boys. Yeah. Because he entrusted her with the taped recordings of the boys' confessions. 
but then he breaks up with her because she's just crazy. She's going to his kids while she's living in their house, saying that she can be a better mother. So he finally is fed up and kicks her out. Well, she's she's also like an L.A. stereotype. So, you know, what does Julan do? Like literally after she gets kicked out of the house, the next scene is her sitting down with the homicide detective mm -hmm. and telling them everything. So then the house gets raided. And that's how the police get those uh, priceless recordings out of Dr. Oziel. So episode three, the boys are in jail, right? They've been arrested. And this is in reference to the seed you already talked about, which is um, we get a scene to a song. I think it's Stevie V and it's about money mm -hmm. and then we just get this like three minute montage of the boys trying to get dimes like two nickels to make phone calls because mm -hmm. that's all the pay phones will take in jail yeah and i don't know if they were trying to sh i just felt like that had no purpose because that should have been an opportunity to show how these rich kids are being treated in j prison or jail well it's <laughs> This was before Alanis's time, but it would have been like, isn't it ironic, don't you think, kind of vibe. Like, Then we see that at one point, of course, we get like a nude shower scene with Eric where some inmate rips off Eric's toupee. Don't even, not sure how they knew it was a toupee. But even better is there is an inmate, like the most handsome inmate in the jail. The, yeah, he's a very beautiful man. Who and, happens to be gay and, and he has eyes for Eric. Which is not unbelievable because Eric's a good looking guy too. But that's when we realized like, oh, Eric might be a little fruity. Mm -hmm. And then we get a moment where they take a seductive shower where you're getting like full, where you're getting Eric's frontal nudity that I found very interesting. Interesting. Well, the, the whole kind of slant that Ryan Murphy brings is, is playing up the uh sexual dynamic, the incest rumored between the brothers. And there... This has turned into a whole Leopold and Loeb vibe, uh, that, which, I, I mean, those are significant liberties, I think, that he's taking. And I, I think that sometimes it seems exploitative. Yes. Oh, not seems. It is. <laughs> uh, so there's an O.J. Simpson connection that we see in, I think, episode eight. But it starts in this episode because the, the family hires Robert Shapiro mm -hmm. to represent the boys. And he is very, like... Okay, clearly these boys killed their parents, talking to the family who's paying for all of it. So we need to work on a deal. And the family is very resistant. No, we need someone who believes they can get them off. And Robert Shapiro says, well, good luck with that, because no one is going to believe these boys didn't kill their parents. Yeah, he's he wants them, and that was kind of always Shapiro's thing, right? That he wanted to cop a deal. We're told. In the series that he was known, he was the attorney you call if you want to cop a good deal. Yeah. But he's not necessarily going to get you off. So, of course, they fire Robert Shapiro. But what's interesting about Shapiro is uh, he's blamed for bringing Eric back, who's at a, on a tennis tournament in Israel, saying that you don't want to get hemmed up by Interpol somewhere over there so you need to come home and surrender yourself that's why shapiro gave the advice that eric should come home and surrender but then later in when he spoiler later on eric is talking to oj simpson because they shared cell or they were next to each other that it was shapiro's bad advice to do that but that's how you know that these are spoiled rich american children that have never had to fend for themselves they have no survival skills because if you ever have to work for anything and if you ever, ever have to lie for anything, you uh, think of escape plan. Like, Eric's so stupid for, he should have, uh, hello, Polanski is uh, doing okay in France. You could just stay over there. The same thing with Lyle is like, learn to shut your mouth. It's like these, these children, you know, they kept calling it the perfect crime. I was reminded of Trump so many times and the self, calling yourself a genius. It's like, no. Absolutely not. <laughs> I think episode three is probably the best example of this being a dark comedy because we get, so first we get, because Lyle and Eric were staying in the same holding place, but like with in separate, like their cells were next to each other. So they were passing notes, one of which was an escape plan. So we get a montage of them, like their escape plan. Where like some friends gonna like drive their Porsche into the jail and like break them out, and then once they get out, the most ridiculous moment is they say they're gonna get plastic surgery. Yeah, and we see them like with their plastic surgery results, and mm -hmm. they look like Nick Kroll. 
They look like if Nick Kroll were doing white chicks as a trans man. Like, it's so out of control. It's out of control. But the, the, what's so mind-blowing is that Eric kept the note. He put it under his mattress. Even that little kid in Speak No Evil is like, you got to eat the evidence because you want to live, don't you? Okay, then this is where my hatred for the Nathan Lane character comes because we see that Dominic Dunn and Leslie Abramson meet each other, I think at a restaurant, mm -hmm. and they're just being so bitchy. Yes. Like, <laughs> what is happening? Well, and she, she's like, Lady, uh, ladies with ladies who lunch is more your thing, not mine. Like, there's all these insinuations about Dominic Dunn being gay, who I think didn't clearly say anything about that because he had children. Famously, Dominique, who was murdered, which is a, a, a plot point, which uh, we're led to understand how he and why he's doing what he's doing. Because he's kind of like the guy from Unsolved Mysteries. Robert like, Stack. Like it's his mission now to advocate for this kind of thing. And also Dominic Dunn's son was an actor. Griffin Dunn, actor and director, yes. The one the one kid who was in... An American World in London, among yeah. many, many things. Okay, then Leslie Abramson gets hired because we see that she got off some other kid who killed his parents, mm -hmm. but put made it seem like it was in self-defense and it worked. So they hire her. That first meeting with Leslie and Eric was crunchy. Well, her then, performance, I warm up to her significantly, and by the end, I really did like her performance, but that episode, her in episode three was terrible. I, I think the dialogue, again, is something that I think the actors always have to overcome in a, in a Ryan Murphy production. I think that's always the case, and I think when they have more time to delve into it is when it works the best. That's I, that's why I think Bardem works here and I think Ari Grainer. But she is definitely trying. Uh, there's, there, there's a voice characterization going on um, that is evident in Because we, it, it was so distracting that we even stopped the series to listen to actual audio of Leslie Abramson to see if she spoke with that affect, and she doesn't. And also, I haven't watched Edie Falco's uh, representation of Leslie Abramson in that series that was done a few years ago. And I don't know, it made me want to go back and watch in the 90s, like Beverly D'Angelo. I do too, actually. Beverly D'Angelo and Jill Clayburgh. I want to watch the Lifetime one with uh, Courtney Love. Courtney Love, that's like 2017. But Beverly D'Angelo and Jill Clayburgh both played Kitty in the 90s, which I think is <laughs> interesting. Okay. The, the, the way that, like you mentioned in your poll quote, the tone swinging everywhere, because episode three ends with us learning that Lyle molested his brother Eric and that he did it because the dad was molesting Lyle. Mm -hmm. And then we learn that Eric, well, the boys were putting cinnamon in their dad's like coffee and stuff so that his semen would taste better and that they were eating lemon juice to numb their taste buds. I just feel like the entire episode is a joke and then it ends with really <laughs> disturbing stuff, uh -huh. which just feels so tacky to me. Well, and, and then you have to remember the context of the 90s and what we were allowed to talk about in the media and stuff like this was not trauma, you know, none of this stuff was talked about in, in this realm. Sure. So people, I think, were were shocked and I th it's just like the satanic panic that was going on with those those boys in the lost paradise. Mm -hmm. uh, documentary series that were wrongly convicted. We want to, it's like we want to believe in that tabloid fodder. Like there was a real uh, desire to stay tuned to that. Okay, episode four, we focus on why the dad was exceptionally hard on the boys as they got older. And we find out that before they were in Beverly Hills, they had a fabulous life living in their dream home in Calabasas. But the boys were burglarizing their neighbors because they all went to these this fancy school together and they all knew when everyone was on vacation mm -hmm. so they would go and steal and it's not really made clear why they were doing it except at one point one says well this is easier than asking our parents for money and they, they don't use this language in the this series but they were doing what's called a hot prowl which is where the they're burglarizing these homes while the sometimes the occupant the residents were at home so then of course, that causes them big trouble. Then Jose, the dad, is fixated on Lyle going to Princeton, and he gets in. But then he gets caught cheating, which is like, Javier Bardem is so... Like, the way he's por portraying Jose is like, he's just this bull. Yeah. He goes to, like, the principal or the dean of the principal, <laughs> the dean of Princeton, and is say, or of the school Lyle's in, 
and like demanding, like you are not kicking my son out. And they come up with a deal that will suspend him for a year. So during that year, Lyle has to work for his dad. And then Lyle's all stressed. I don't know what it was, but he's losing his hair. He's going bald at like 20. And one day while Lyle's in like a board meeting with his dad and all of his associates, the dad just calls him out like, are you going bald? And then we cut to them at like hair club for men and Lyle trying on a wig. But doesn't want, I mean, again, the kind of, uh, uh, the options that were available to men back then were very limited and you had to have a lot of money. Uh, okay. So if, if you're not really interested in, in the series, I would recommend watching three of the episodes. The first episode is episode four, the one we're talking about right now, because the bulk of it is Lyle describing the sexual abuse he endured. And I did think that while the performance was kind of crunchy, the, what he was saying was affecting. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that scene, again, the tone, is that after Lyle like expresses all these really disturbing details, we drastically swing to Nathan Lane's character gossiping. And I just hated every second of Nathan Lane's portrayal of Dominic Dunn. <laughs> Um, and then we end episode four with Lyle saying that he and Eric were afraid that his, their parents were going to kill them on a shark fishing trip. And that's when they realized they needed to kill their parents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then second episode, I think people need to watch is episode five and it's, um, the shortest episode because the entire episode appears to be like one take and it's just Eric talking. And we see the back of Leslie Abramson's head while she asks him questions. And he's recounting all of the sexual abuse he endured for 30 minutes. And uh, that's corroborating basically what his brother said. Be so, Because we have to remember too that they both, both of the brothers had different lawyers. Because Lyle's lawyer, Jill, is played by Jess Wexler. Who's also, I think, kind of entertaining in her small bits. I agree. So while... I think the best acting from Cooper Coke, is that his name? Mm -hmm. Was that episode. That's that episode. And it is very upsetting. So I, I found that very powerful. Well, because you were able to witness how you believe that Leslie Abramson became emotionally invested in this person. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, episode six is about Jose and Kitty. We see they met in like 1960s that, of course, Kitty's parents didn't like her marrying an ethnic, but they go away and get married. We also see, we, this is the episode we get the most of Chloe Sevigny because we see her talking to the therapist saying that she hates her kids. That they're uh, parasites. Yeah. As well. Um, uh, but also what it, that establishes, and again, I, I'm assuming great liberties were taken that both of these people, Kitty and Jose came from significant cycles of abuse. Because I think that's what the underlying motif of all of this season is. Well, they explained that in a later episode that Kitty grew up in a home where her father was extremely abusive to not only the mother, but the children. And then Jose expresses that his mother molested him. Mm -hmm. So we get that. We also, we get a pretty upsetting scene where Jose one day is just sitting at the kitchen table at 530 in the morning and Kitty comes downstairs like, what are you doing? And he's like, bitch, I don't love you or these kids. I'm going to New York. Got to make more money since that's all you care about. Ta-ta. And so, of course, she's upset about it. But then there's a scene not too much long, not longer, where he's like, I left the woman that I've been seeing and oh. I do love you. It felt very like, schizophrenic. Okay, but before that happens, the craziest scene in this entire series happens, which is that Jose goes to New York because he were, he's new at RCA Records and he's been sent there to sign the group Menudo, mm -hmm. which he does, which I find strange because there were accusations that Jose Menendez molested one of the boys in Menudo, mm -hmm. but the series doesn't mention that. It just mentions that he signed them. But after he signs the deal, he's in good spirits. So what does he do? Hire this like white twunk prostitute. And then we get this really... I mean, it was uncomfortable because we had heard before from Lyle and Eric that their dad justified his sexual abuse towards them by saying that that's what the Greeks did. Mm -hmm. and, or Sparta. And, yeah. Spar and the Spartans uh, did, did that to help the men be men. And it wasn't gay. And clearly the dad is extremely homophobic. But somehow having sex with boys who are your children isn't a problem. And he 
convinces this prostitute to basically like beat him while he wears the Greek leaf. He wears Caesar's laurels. <laughs> and then we see... He pulls out a big bottle of poppers. And then we see the boys start to get to work and the face Javier Bardem is making took me all the way out. It, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was crazy. Mm -hmm. Then we get a scene where Kitty, the mom, basically threatens to poison her, her children. And then she serves them dinner. And there's some weird stuff on top like, of their spaghetti. Like paprika. It looked like, yeah, cumin or something. And it, it, they kind of smell it and it smells weird. So they're convinced she's trying to kill them. And then she collapses, like she's had a seizure, but then we find out she's faking it. And there's a really funny, again, this is a comedy, because then we see Chloe Sevigny sort of like reaching up for a bottle of Moscato. <laughs> and then they clock her that she's faking it. Guzzling it. Just like we see Lyle at uh, L.A., was it at the LA T Taste of LA? Yes. Was screaming at the woman that I need more white zin. Trying to get an, uh, he's trying to secure an, uh, an alibi yes. for where he was the night his parents were murdered. But we also get a scene <laughs> where apparently Eric, and this is Eric as like a big boy, like a 20 year old, have like, like athlete's foot. And then Jose just walks into the mansion like, here, I got you this prescription foot cream. I don't know what to do with it. Well, rub it on your feet, Is dummy. there spray? Yeah, is there a spray option? Is there an anal option? And the dad's like, give me your foot. And then he's like seductively rubbing the cream. But then telling him like, you're no good at tennis. You need to stop that. Oh, and then he asks his son if he's gay. Mm -hmm. And then says like, well, you're going to date this girl because I'm going to be a senator and I can't like I need... I can't have a gay son and you're going to take a prom picture with her. I don't care if you go back and have sex with that Craig boy. And that's when we learn who mm -hmm. supposedly his old lover was. And then <laughs> we also understand that the dad is very, well, we find out that the mom was very concerned about AIDS. Yes. Well, everybody was then. And that she, but well, specifically her, her son, Eric, and that she would check his penis for herpes sores but then we find out the reason why it's because jose had given eric condoms and he knows that eric's having sex because he wrote about it in his journal mm -hmm. or wrote a note that he's having sex with this boy but he's not using the condoms mm -hmm. so jose is concerned like well i don't want him to bring aids into this house and it's like oh yeah because you might get it from your son i i found that all like it just, I felt like I was in a fever dream in it, these scenes. It, it was it, so unserious. It's not unlike the, what, what they do with uh, Andrew Cunanan in, in kind of painting this picture of what the culture was like that kind of helped create this monster. And you can see those elements of floating around in this, but it never really, it, never, it doesn't really come together effectively. And, and, you know, shout out to some of the great directors that did some of these episodes, including Carl Franklin and Paris Barclay. Barclay did the best episode of the Dahmer series. Yeah, episode four. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Just like you have a lot of very capable people working on this, but it, I don't know. Like it's just not concise. The end of episode six is Jose calls his mom to confront her about her abuse towards him, which is ironic. Okay, okay episode seven starts with, again, I don't know why we needed this Dominic Dunn character so much, but we get the scene where he's at the trial for the guy who murdered his daughter mm -hmm. and he's screaming at the judge and oh, I just couldn't stand him. No, and then of course he did sit in on the OJ trial and wrote about that. And in Murphy's um, series on the Simpson trial, Dominic Dunn is played by Robert Morris in that. So mm. that, that kind of find it interesting that we're got had these intersections going on. But it does give um, Nathan Lane and Leslie Abramson or, and Ari Grainer a good scene. Sure. Because she's, she says, like, I'm sorry about what happened to your daughter. Because he's taunting Leslie. But, you know, he, he gave you a perspective. Oh, she tells him he gave you a career mm -hmm. and an effing point of view. Yes. You should thank him. Mm -hmm. I thought that was cold that as That was hell. a good scene, yeah. Okay, then we see Lyle's dumbass in jail having all these visitors come. And he's asking them in the jail, on the phone, with all the COs around, Asking them to lie for him to say like, yeah, remember when you saw my dad molest me? Remember when my mom threw me in the 
the closet and I was covered in feces and I had to pee in a Tupperware box and all the people are like, that never happened. I never saw that. His and cousin. he's becoming irate. Like, why won't you lie for His me? His cousin's like, are you sure that was me? <laughs> oh gosh. I really did enjoy Lyle's lawyer. And I thought she looked like if you mix Shelley Long and Joan Cusack and then her wig. Just that hair. But Jess Wexler. She's super cute though. Did you ever see Teeth? Where she had the vagina dentata. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's her? Yeah, that's her. Oh. The, the, this episode is also where we get Lyle sort of explaining. Th there's a pretty effective scene where they're coaching him. Mm -hmm. In a gently though, like. Because they, because you know how they will record the, like them on the witness stand, like as practice so they can play it back so they can refine the performance. And at first, Lyle comes across like a psychopath because he's like blank and no emotion. And they're like, you need to give us something more. And he's like, you want me to cry? I can do that. And then I have to say, I think his best performance was in episode seven, where he basically explains why he felt like he needed to kill his parents. Mm -hmm. That was effective. Yes, uh, but it, it's funny listening to the. I wanted more of the two uh, women, his lawyers, talking because uh, they're also you know, they're, it's mutually beneficial what they're doing, but there also is a separation because uh, Leslie Abrams says like that she thinks Lyle's a bad actor, but she's like, what if Lyle convinced Eric to do everything? And right away, Jill was like, oh, what if it's the other way around? Like, the, gosh, I actually would have preferred, uh, well, we can get to that. Anyway, nine episodes, it's not until the middle of episode seven that the trial starts. The In such time. a the first trial in such an unceremonious way. Mm -hmm. It just starts. Um, and then uh, it's in episode seven where we see that the mom caught Lyle and Eric in the shower being sexual, like as adults. Mm -hmm. um, and then this was the epitome of my hatred for Nathan Lane because there's a dinner scene where again, he's just going on and on. About Pre he's preaching. He's on a soapbox. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that dinner, there's this, because he had it catered, and there's this obviously gay cater waiter who is like wrapping up for the evening. So it's just Nathan Lane and this waiter. And clearly Nathan Lane is hitting on him. And the waiter is picking up what he put down. And then Nathan Lane tells this long story about his daughter. My other problem, and I think it's in my pull quote about the narrative redundancy, we hear about some of this stuff multiple, multiple times. Yes. And this was the last straw with Nathan, Nathan Lane's character talking about his daughter. But after mm -hmm. this wait, this gay waiter listens to him and enjoys a serving of tiramisu, he offers to stay. Like, if you want some sexual company, and then Nathan Lane says, no, I have to get up for court tomorrow and you have your audition. He has a shoot in the morning, not understanding how metabolism works. Like, I'll work off the tiramisu in the morning. It's like, it doesn't stick to your ribs that quick son. and then we hear about the abuse again in the trial so mm -hmm. now it's like the fourth time we've heard about it the the, th the thing about the shower the envisioning of kitty seeing them masturbating in the shower together she's always carrying her around this hamper they live in like a three million dollar home and they have a housekeeper who works five days a week live in live in housekeeper floor and she's always like like yeah doing housework yeah like what i, I mean I, she's probably bored uh but <laughs> She's got, she's, we see Chloe carrying a hamper one too many times. It's the end of episode seven where we realize that Lyle's little crazy ass pen pal has been recording his conversations. Okay, episode eight is the scene with Judalon on the witness stand. And that was full comedy. It was giving me the, the pothead and serial mom on the witness stand talking about, it was a blue car. <laughs> because they're making her seem like she's mentally ill and it's working, but it's just so funny. Mm -hmm. And then it's unclear like who she's benefiting, the prosecution or the defense, because everything out of her mouth sounds like craziness. Mm -hmm. Although, and then we get the North, Northridge earthquake. Yes. Mm -hmm. And like 12 aftershocks, which has caused Eric to have like PTSD. Oh, Eric. Poor, fragile Eric. Well, speaking of poor, fragile Eric, he finally takes the stand after his brother gave a star turn as a witness. And we get this super awkward scene, not unlike the dimes, dimes, dimes scene where Eric keeps popping the mic. Mm -hmm. You could have a drinking game for the number of times in this three minute scene where Leslie Abramson is telling Eric, you're popping the mic. Mm -hmm. Because it's like 
there's an issue with the mic that they explain. Mm -hmm. Leslie goes, you're aware of the peculiarities of the microphone situation. You can't get too close. You can't be too far back. Just sit in the middle. Sit back in your chair and just sit there. And Eric, being so feeble and just annoying, can't just sit still. He keeps popping the mic, getting too close, causing static. That was like someone scratching a chalkboard to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's like trial footage from the 93 trial or whatever, two trial, where he was doing that. What other, what else was like uh, nails on a chalkboard was all of these Izod sweaters. Oh my God, let's not relive that. Let's not. There are so many of those sweaters in this. It is cringy and, and kind of funny and on purpose, clearly, but there's a lot of sweaters. So after it's declared a mistrial, Leslie, um, which kind of reminded me of uh, Marsha Clark, uh, yeah, she gets all of the women who voted to acquit the female jurors who were on the boys' side. She invites them to her home to interview them to figure out like what worked, what what could I have done better, and they're all just all these women just really like Eric. They want to talk to him. They're like groupies. Uh huh. But one of the ladies, when they all leave, she stay, She falls back and she's like, hey, I didn't want to say this in front of everyone else. And I don't think anyone else wanted to tell you this. But when you were asking what the problem was, the real reason that the men were against the boys wasn't because they didn't believe the boys. It's because they didn't like you. Because Leslie has was a flamboyant personality. But And you see, again, it's very much kind of what... Marsha also had to go through, but uh, it's like, you know, men don't like you. You are an outspoken, powerful woman. So I, I enjoyed her performance because I'm not familiar with the actual Leslie Abramson's trial performance or like recordings of it. But I thought that in this series, it, she would have, re it resonated with me what she was saying. Yes. Okay. So then uh, who's Lyle's attorney? Jill. Her shining moment was the end of episode eight because she has to confront Lyle mm -hmm. about not having any money <laughs> because Leslie's working pro bono, but then we find out that the family paid her a million dollars. So did. she's all right. But um, Jill says, you don't have any money. So like, clearly I don't work for free. So I'm going to help you find a good public defender. And then Lyle goes, well, I'm writing a book. So once I get the money for that, and she goes, writing a book, your little stupid girlfriend already wrote the book based on your damn recording, stupid. And here I have some quotes that... Uh, oh my God, I thought she was so good in that scene. Mm -hmm. Well, also when um, they're coaching Lyle to be more emotional and he's like, you want me to, you want me to cry? And Jess Wexler goes, yes. Yes, please. <laughs> Come on now. Give me something I can use. But when Ari Grainer's like, like you're back, you are facing the death penalty. Could you uh, perform in this song and dance that's expected of you? The end of episode eight is Eric back in jail because it was a mistrial. So of course they have to wait for another trial. And OJ Simpson gets brought in. Mm-hmm. And they make a big deal about it. They clean the jail for him. Eric is like scrubbing the floors to get ready for their celebrity inmate. And they're housed next to each other. And that's when OJ and Eric talk for a little bit. Okay, episode nine. This is the start of the second trial. And I thought a funny line straight off the top was Lyle thinking that he knows what's best. Mm -hmm. And he says, you need a tagline like OJ did, because he keeps saying, if OJ can get off, why can't we get off? Like He clearly killed those people. And he's like, they had a tagline, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And, he's, and he says, our tagline should be, if you've been abused, you cannot be accused. <laughs> no. Okay, I think episode nine is exactly what I wanted from this entire series, because the trial with this new prosecutor, oh my God. <clears throat> if I would have been on that jury, I would have been like, guilty, guilty. Oh, yeah. He, well, yeah. And Leslie seems to have had a meltdown. She's unraveling, like <laughs> yes. a full-on meltdown. And it was that kind of drama and the intensity of that 
episode is what the entire series should have been. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's just interesting too, the mistrial, while like some people think that is a blessing, what it takes away, especially if you're lying and not a good liar, it takes away the immediacy, immediacy of that emotion that the brothers could tap into because everything became so stale by yeah. 96. And we had all these other greater, more sensational cases. Like, the, you know, I think OJ probably did hurt public perception of them. Yeah. Uh, you have a connection to this story because Eric Menendez had this little girlfriend in prison named Tammy, who's from your small town. Yeah, we're from the same small town. I won't say where because I know she doesn't like to either, but... Oh. Uh, <laughs> Damn. They didn't treat either of us well, girl. Uh, <laughs> Another nice treat is Vicky Lawrence appears in episode nine, who people should know from Mama's Family. Yes, I didn't know that till she started speaking, though. Well, I was a big fan of uh, Mama's Family for her and Bubba. But anyway, um, she plays the juror who, when it's time to sentence them, she is like, I am all about the death uh, penalty. Mm -hmm. Because these boys are monsters. And I thought her... Like 90 second moment was really good. And then she drops dead <laughs> during like in the conference room. Yes. And the alternate is the reason that this jury decides on life without parole and not the death sentence. And that juror, the alternate is played by the guy from Galaxy Quest. Yeah. Alan Rickman's little protege, Thermian protege. Yeah. Okay. The end for the boys is that once they've been sentenced to dual life sentences without parole, they get separated. And I thought that scene was so weird because both boys, I'm calling them boys. These were grown ass men who killed their The parents. media was calling them boys too. But they uh, get taken, were removed from the jail to go to their new prison. And they kind of cross paths and they don't see each other till they get outside and they get put in two separate vans. And then we get Millie Vanilli's I miss you, girl, playing again. It just feels so inappropriate. And then... We get a bird's eye shot of the caravans going in opposite directions. And I thought that was a powerful moment that could have... I mean, first of all, the music really killed it. Because sure. it just felt funny. Again, more funny than... And then the final scene of the series is we see Jose and Kitty on that boat when they were going shark fishing. And it's an episode nine that the new prosecutor tells a very different story that those boys were not abused there is no actual evidence they were abused there's only one medical record that shows that eric had bruising to the back of his throat that they were saying was consistent with when people eat like um a popsicle like a popsicle and like they hits like it hits them in the back of the throat and then so they paint a very different picture. And then we get witnesses saying that the boys were the most vile kids. So we get these recreations of the boy, like basically saying that the parents were afraid of the kids. We get a scene where Jose surprises Lyle with a brand new car, an Alfa Romeo spider, and Lyle throws a tantrum that it's like a cheap, stupid car. So... They, so a very different picture is painted of the parents and the boys. And then the final scene of the series is the parents on the boat on the day that they claimed they thought their parents were going to kill them. But the way this one's played out is like, that's the day the boys are planning to kill the parents. Mm -hmm. And then it was kind of a sad scene because the parents... They have their own problems, just like all our parents do, have their own problems in their own lives. But it seems like they're in a better place. Yes. And, and that they realize that there's something going on with their kids, but... I, I mean, and then we cut to the other end of the boat, mm -hmm. and it's Lyle and Eric saying, we're going to do it. And then the series ends. Yeah, it's just, uh, again, we it, the series needed a lot more chilling moments like that. But it's nice that we finally got to see the Menendez, uh, Jose and Kitty allowed to seem like actual humans because they don't really. And again, it's because of how we're playing with all these perspectives, but in a very sloppy way. Yeah, because for seven and a half hours, we get them being monsters, Jose and Kitty. And then we get like 20 minutes of them being like parents who were struggling with these difficult kids who they probably admittedly spoiled. But again, and, but that, you know, there's a level of detail sometimes that's impressive in the background. Like we see Eric reading Atlas Shrugged, he's reading Ayn Rand, which is very fitting to me with uh, somebody that maybe would go down that path of thinking the way he did. Uh, but but then again, the, the storytelling is, 
all over the place. And I, I don't know how, you know, it had two, sh two showrunners. Besides Ryan Murphy, there was Ian, Ian Brennan, who directed two episodes of this as well. But I don't know, just the level of organization seems like it was a little rushed. Uh, I mentioned the music, which I was disappointed in. We get the several moments of Millie Vanilli. We get a couple, we see that Jose is playing Crowded House in his car. We hear that twice. We get some um, Snap. We get some Vanilla Ice. And then the opening is Kenny G. I was just, the music was not impressive. But I want to end since we only have, I think, like two minutes left. The, I think the better approach to this series would have been, it definitely does not need to be nine episodes. I'm thinking it could have been six episodes. So episodes one, two, three should have been the like the boys and their abusive life with their parents. Episode two would have been them planning and then actually killing their parents. Episode three is the trial, the first trial, where we focus on the abuse and the imperfect self-defense. And then episode four is now from the perspective of the parents and how the boys were a nightmare and the parents didn't know what to do and they were scared. And then episode five could have been the murder from the parents' perspective of like the days leading up to that and like the shark fishing trip. And then episode six would have been the second trial where we really focus on the boys being master manipulators who committed this premeditated murder with Eric lying in wait. Mm -hmm. I want, like, I feel like we should have had equal exposure to both scenarios and you could have done it where you just mirror the perspectives. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so disappointed that I really only felt satisfied in episode nine with the alternate story. It just feels really biased and exploitative. I'm sure the family does not approve of this series. I wouldn't either. I'd be mad as hell. I think both the brothers have put out, well, I know specifically Eric did have, have put out statements against. Uh, I mean, I believe those series. boys killed their parents, but, and we know that they did, but yes. so I'm not defending them, but I'd be mad too if I were them. Like there's so much conjecture and made up shit in this series. And I mean, they don't come across. I mean, I, you know, the thing is when you, when you think about Ryan Murphy doing Joan Crawford or Andrew Cunanan, and there, there's kind of um, a case to be had that they were also humans that, that did some terrible, horrible, yeah. terrifying things, but, but they were also human. They, they were products of their environment and you really don't get that. And the no. Menendez brothers, I do believe were products of, the, of their environment, but they are so unlikable that there's, maybe there is no way to, 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 to give them kind of any salvation. Perhaps. What would you give this series? Well, now whenever I see Ryan Murphy's name, it's like fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of a tawdry one. Uh, but this is, this is a two. I think this is a miss. Uh, I would not recommend sitting through this. Not, uh, not all at once. So, oh, I said three episodes. I would rec recommend episodes uh, three, four, and nine. And you get the gist of it. But wait, three, four, I thought it was four, five, and nine. He's right. I recommend episodes four, five, and nine. Anything else? No. Join us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>